long haul. So, of course, buying real property, buying a home is going to be one of your largest investments that you ever make. Um, as time goes on, you may even upgrade to a larger house, given that's even more of a large investment. So, the preparation of doing so is severely important. The average home is retained for seven to 10 years. So that's, that's national average and certainly some homes are retained for less and some for much longer, but seven to 10 is the average. And interestingly enough, the average mortgage is only kept for three to five years. <clears throat> uh, and that's a little surprising to me. However, I really truly feel that that average is going to, to drastically change given that our interest rates have been so good for so long Surely the majority of people that have homes have refinanced and they're somewhere in the threes or fours or maybe even in the twos on a 15 year. It's amazing. But remember that even though this is one of the largest investments and you may in fact have it for seven to 10 or more years, um, it, you know, it doesn't have to be the perfect home. And even if it's not the perfect home and it, and, and it, is just really a fixer upper. It's a it's a staged home, something you're you're only jumping from here to there. You gotta want to stay in it for at least three years. And I say that because the national appreciation of property is between three and five percent. So even if we look at the lower part of three percent, or maybe it's a down one or two years, so maybe it's the appreciation isn't up to the average. Um, if we only have say two years. Of appreciation, that's probably not going to be enough to cover what you had already paid in closing costs and the real estate commissions that you that you pay when you sell the property and the closing costs that you pay when you do sell the property. So it's you know this is a large investment that that has to be a smart investment so that you're not losing money. Because yeah, sure, you need a place to live, but you don't want to lose money. That's never the goal. All right. So, yes, real estate can be absolutely one of your smartest investments. You do not have to love it. You don't have to live there forever, but you do need to live somewhere. So why not buy real property, live in it, achieve some appreciation. The payments remain the same, which is always nice given the California limit to renting is 5% increase in payment. So your landlord could increase your rental at 5% every year. So your home, if it's on a fixed mortgage, is gonna remain the same. So let's look at the mental process. Um, so this is an interesting one. Now imagine yourself, you and I are walking through the property, whether you're you're with your, your beloved or you're just by yourself walking through the property, which type of person are you? You walk into the kitchen, you go, ah, oh, it, look, it's a perfect triangle. The stove is right there, the sink, the refrigerator, that's perfect. Oh, and we can put the high table right here and that's where I can make my, my bread for the holidays and the oven is big enough. Oh, they have to leave the oven. It's big enough for the whole bread. I don't, I don't even have to burn, bend it into a horseshoe. This is perfect. And oh my gosh, the countertop over there, that's, uh, I'm gonna get a new coffee maker for that. That is so perfect. Or are you the type of person that when you walk into that kitchen and somebody's going off about all these aspects, you're going, uh, yeah. Yeah, that's nice. Um, I don't see any wet spot stains on the ceiling, so I guess the roof is okay, but I wonder how old the roof is. When was it repaired last? How old is it? Uh, I better look underneath the, the sink, see if there's any water damage to the floor there. Uh, so there's two different types of people. You know, there's the emotional one that they, they just, they nest it. They put their items in this, the spots and they, they just visualize it. And there's the rational buyers. The ones that are looking at the finances, the interest rate, the roof, the grass. It's a beautiful lawn, but how much water does it take? Having gone through now that visualization and that practice, <clears throat> which type of person are you? Think about it and remember it because, yes, kitchens and bathrooms and lawns sell homes. But we got to make sure that A, we have our big goggles on that we're looking at the entire picture. We want 
the little things, the, the, the fine aspects to be correct. We do. We want to look at the big stuff. How old is that roof? Will we have to repaint the fascia boards next year? Is that lawn using so much water that I really can't afford it? We got to look at the whole thing because <clears throat> that is going to determine whether we really do want to buy. So we look at the whole picture, look at the location, what it's going to take to upkeep. When you're renting, you're not painting eaves, you're not mowing lawns, you're making a payment to use that domicile for 30 days. Buying is totally different. So we want to make sure and take our time, have the big goggles on so we see the whole picture. Because as a few of you know, when you actually start the ball rolling, it moves pretty quick. And you can move from starting to look for a house to closing on a house in 10 days ish, uh, 10 weeks, <laughs> 10 days would be a little fast. <clears throat> so, but after you have totally decided and you've walked yourself through this and your partner and yes, I do want to buy a house. What's next? Well, the finances, most of us and most people, I'm going to go with 95% of the nation don't have enough of a savings account to write a check to, to buy a house. So they're going to need some financing. So how does that work? Well, it's a little, it's more simple than you would actually think. So firstly, we're going to lead you to the website. We're going to say, okay, here, here's the link it says apply. Now you simply log into that and you answer all the questions, whether it's filling in numbers or, or answering questions, put in addresses, and it's very intuitive. So it's not going to ask you for other properties. If you don't own other properties, it's, it's very quick and intuitive, not a tough process. After that is completed, then we get some supporting documentation. And we take a look at the whole picture. The whole picture is going to show us a, what your income is in reference to your debts. And that's called your debt to income ratio DTI. The DTI in most cases is limited to 45%. Now, some are less for sure, and some are more. Of course, a veteran's loan, a VA loan, really doesn't care about DTI. They care more about residual income. So I've done VA loans up to 60, 65% debt to income ratio. And just to be clear, the debt to income ratio, the debts include the principal interest tax and insurance, Homeowner Association, Melarus, tax, all these things in reference to the home and also include your car payment, your credit card payments, your washing machines, dryers that might be financed and on your credit report. If it's on your credit report, it's part of your debt to income ratio. And if your student loans, if you have student loans, um, if they're on there, but they don't have a payment, then we're going to hit that with 1% of the balance. So. <laughs> If you owe 100,000 on your student loans, but you don't yet have a payment, we're gonna hit you with $1,000 per month as a payment. That's just a rule of thumb guideline. Um, various programs have various guidelines to that aspect, but here's an example. So your debt to income ratio in reference to debt is all of those in reference to your gross income. That, that makes up your percentage. So if we go with 45% and you make uh, let's go with $1,000 a month, $450 a month can go to your total debt. That leaves you 55% to buy gas and utilities and, and go for dinners and movies and those kinds of things. Um, so that's a really important aspect to note. Um, also, of course, credit. Your credit in reference to a mortgage ranges between 300 and 850 points. So if you're credit score is 700, that's pretty good. And anything above 700 eh, pretty much um, dictates the best interest rate and the best program, depending on how you're paid, which is another aspect that we won't go into uh, on this session. But if your credit score is under 600, then we're probably going to, going to want to have a chat and do a little work on it before we actually uh, make the plunge into searching for a home and, and actually getting you qualified because credit scores dictate or represent to the lender your ability and willingness to repay that loan. So statistics have shown that anything rather a credit score under 600, they're not as apt to pay on time. And actually the average credit score of loans being done in the last year 
was 720, which may sound high, but that's the average. And even with an FHA loan, which is a bigger box, and in session four, we'll talk a lot, the whole session is about different types of loans, whether it's down payment assistance or non-QM stated bank statements, tons of different types of loans. We'll talk about those in session four, but um, the credit score is tremendously important. So I wanna make sure and take a look at that. So you're qualified for the financing. We know how much your max is that you can afford. Are we ready to go? No, we need to have a chat about closing costs. Now, closing costs are one of those things that are wildly misunderstood. So let's first start off with the fact that closing costs are those expenses that are paid at closing, as well as your down payment of the loan, if you have one. Um, and they include taxes, insurance, uh, title, escrow, appraisal, lender fees, um, all these all these professionals help to keep us um, you know, the whole transaction correct. So a title officer in title insurance helps to ensure that the seller owns the property and that it's free of any impingements, clouds uh, on title, that he can transfer the, the property legally. So we want that insurance. And it's it's not terrible expensive, but could you imagine walking over to a guy and giving him a shoebox full of money and he gives you the keys and he walks away and three days later a lady walks up and says what are you doing in my house that doesn't happen in our world never so title insurance appraiser so the appraiser years ago used to work primarily for the real estate agent and the uh, mortgage broker loan loan officer and in those days, there were a few times, I never saw those transactions, but there were a few times where the appraiser may have inflated the value of the property in order to get the deal done. Well, that doesn't happen any longer because all the appraisers work for an AMC, which is an appraisal management company. The appraisal management company is hired by the bank, the lender, the investor. They hire that AMC and those appraisers are on a roster that they just come around next in line, next in line, next in line, gets the next appraisal ordered and then the next and then the next. So your appraiser that goes out to the property, subject property, whether you own it already or brand new to the market and this is the one you have an escrow to buy, the appraiser goes, takes pictures, assesses the property, is there deferred maintenance, is there termite damage, is um, dry rot, he looks at all of that kind of stuff and then he compares the condition and location of that property with all other like properties, generally within um, a six month time period and within uh, half a mile is best, but certainly they can go out further if it's a specialty product, uh, you know, a, a dome home or a mountain cabin kind of a thing. So um, that appraiser gives it a real one-time value of what it is worth in the marketplace in comparison to everything else that has sold of like properties. And that appraisal then goes to the lender. You, the buyer, certainly get a copy and you can, you know, peruse through it. But that the appraiser, the appraisal is a great thing and you want him on your side and you want to pay him, which is part of the closing costs, because he comes up with that value. Imagine you're in contract to buy a house for 250000 and he comes back with it's worth 240. That's a $10,000 discrepancy. And so you have two options. One, you can write an additional $10,000 check that goes straight to the sellers because the bank won't finance it. The most they'll finance is the lower of the appraised value purchase price. Um, and, and just it's the lower of them. So if you're $10,000 off, you can write a check or there's an opportunity to negotiate. So. If the seller really thinks it's worth the 250 and you don't want to pay but 240 because that's what it pays for, well then that's okay. Contract is canceled, you get your earnest money back and they go back on the market to see if they can get somebody to pay that extra 10 grand. Now, if it was a FHA loan, that value is registered with the government. So if somebody else comes in and wants an FHA loan, value is not going to change for six months. Um, if, however, it's a conventional loan and it 
that uh, the, the somebody that is willing to get a new appraisal, it's possible it could come in different. You know, ten thousand dollars on two hundred and fifty is only about three percent. So, but being off by three percent could certainly happen. But ten thousand dollars on a million dollar property. That's ridiculous. You know, no, no appraiser would be that far off because the appraiser knows what the contract price is. So, okay, too much on appraisals. Um, but lastly, in reference to closing costs, the impound account. So an impound account, as I was pointed out uh, yesterday from our son, um, it, it, he thought that was an escrow account and it is an escrow account, but it's also your impounds. So impounds are tax and insurance taxes um, to pay for property tax that are paid twice a year, um, due in November and uh, delinquent in December, and then second half due in February, late in April. And so impounds for taxes can range from two months worth of impounds or payments into that account, uh, all the way to nine months. So if you had nine months worth of impounds, that could really increase your closing costs. So closing costs are consistent of all of those items and uh, can definitely add up. Okay, let's move on. So we have decided to buy the house. We know what closing costs are all about and the programs that are available, we've looked through. <clears throat> again, we're gonna talk a lot about those in session four. Um, so, but again, we've looked at the maximum that you can qualify for. Let, so let's talk a little bit about that. So just because you can afford a $500,000 loan like Jimmy and Marissa that we chatted with last week. And uh, we have a, we have a great little meeting uh, video that's, that's on our website. If you guys want to check that out, but they qualify for half a million dollars, but they understand that that's not their comfort payment zone that they're not comfortable making a payment on a half a million dollar house. They want to have more life. So they dialed it back to a $400,000 purchase. We weren't getting them pre-approved. Um, not pre-qualified, but pre-approved. And the biggest difference is pre-qualified. You may qualify for a loan, but until an underwriter actually sees the documentation and says, yes, you're approved, eh, it's a little risky. So be, be careful when you do go to, to a mortgage originator that uh, they're not pre-qualifying you. You want to be pre-approved, which means it's been through underwriting. And the only thing they're waiting for is the collateral. Collateral is the property, the home, okay? Um, so they're comfortable with $400,000 purchase price, even though they can buy at 500, um, knowing that the payment never changes. They're, they're getting a fixed rate mortgage for 30 years. Payment is always gonna be the same as opposed to rent that could increase by 5% every year. So they're comfortable with that. So that's part of the thing is find where your comfort zone is even though you, your maximum can be this amount, really it, you want it to be this amount. And that, that's part of seeing the whole picture for sure. So that's all part of buying less house than you can afford is being, being able to have a comfortable payment. You know, you probably in renting didn't go out and say, you know, I think I can, I think I can pay for that and then jump into it. You said, eh, I wanna pay this, and that's what you searched for. You started with money, in most cases, I would think. Um, you know, we talked a little bit about the fact that interest rates are so low, and that average mortgage refinances within three to five years. If you buy a house, um, we're probably within the next, well, definitely in the next six months, probably the next year. Of course, this is an election year. Uh, election year means that interest rates never go up during an election year. You can look at the stats from since we started doing mortgages and elections, a presidential election year, the interest rates are always fantastic and uh, never increase until eh, sometime after the election, eh, probably not December, but January, February, perhaps. Um, so having the, you know, the fact that the interest rates are good, there's uh, plenty of inventory, not near as much as we would like to see, but fantastic time to buy probably would never have to refinance for the whole life of the loan, the whole term that you're in the property. Um, so in reference to targeting properties um, and looking, you know, with the big goggles, the big eyes, um, knowing absolutely reduces your anxiety and allows you to see everything clear. But 
What if I miss something? Well, that's where the home inspector comes in. So after you're in contract and in escrow and you're, you're buying this house and somewhere before or after even the appraiser, the appraiser does the value thing, but he doesn't give it a whole big scrub and take a real deep look at the home, but the home inspector does. Now that's an added cost, usually about 550 bucks, but wildly worth it because if they identify something that is catastrophic and you're just like, I don't want that house with mold, I don't either, of course, then totally worth the 550. Remember, you found something that wasn't illustrated in the contract, you're able to get out, you get your earnest money back, you've spent 550 bucks, that's okay. You didn't get burned with getting a house that you can't live in. So a home inspection is really important. Home inspections usually are about 25 pages long. They rarely say anything nice. They always focus on the negative um, and they take pictures and then textually, you know, explain exactly what's going on, whether it's from lead-based paint to mold to GFI breakers that aren't installed to uh, cover plates that aren't uh, where, where they're supposed to be. So they have safety hazards. And remember the things that are gonna shut a loan down are health, safety, and moisture. So if there's any health aspects that the appraiser points out, they're gonna be fixed, period. Any safety aspects gonna be fixed and moisture. Any penetrations and moisture that's going to wreck that home, the investor, the lender, says, I don't want anything to do with it unless it's fixed by a licensed contractor. So if you do have some water stains in the ceiling, in the living room, then we're gonna need a licensed general contractor or roofing contractor to sign off on that. What was the cause of it? Has it been repaired? Is the roof warranted for five or more years? So these are things that we can get into later, but you're gonna wanna know these things um, and your home inspection report doesn't have to go to your lender because, oh my gosh, it would be a nightmare. But the appraisal obviously goes to the lender. So whatever the appraiser talks about in reference to repairs, health, safety, and moisture are absolutely going to need to be repaired. Termite is, is a uh, report that you can and, and don't have to do. I always recommend that you do a termite report. Southern California, pretty much every property has had or has termites. But how bad is it? So these are all inspections that these licensed professionals do for us um, that charge a fee that I'm willing to pay as a buyer because we wanna know all these things. And knowing your boundaries, knowing that you have all of these people backing you up and sticking to your personal preferences, that's paramount. So the knowledge that you're gaining right now, even though I run through a lot of this stuff really quick, the Gestalt method works to just give you a ton of information. And then when you're exposed to it later, little things pop up. Yeah, I remember. Oh yeah, impounds are escrow, you sub escrow. Yeah, yeah, I remember. And we move on from there. But in reference to looking at the whole picture and personal preferences and little things versus big things, you know, real tours is how it's, they're actually pronounced, real tours. Realtors say that the top three important things in real estate is location, location, location. And for them, that's probably right. And, you know, location in a lot of cases is going to be determined by your loan amount. You may want to live on Sunset in Redlands. I grew up in Redlands. My dad, brothers, we all graduated from Redlands High. My kids, our kids graduated from Redlands High. I know Redlands pretty well. And if you live up on Sunset, you have a great view probably gonna cost a couple extra bucks, but you can live on Buena Vista, you can live on Palm, Highland, those are beautiful areas, much more affordable. So um, Ramit Sethi, fantastic guy. I've read a book or two of his, certainly I've watched his YouTube videos. This is uh, uh, a wildly intelligent guy that really kind of scoffs and laughs at the traditional thoughts of um, investing and saving and working towards what he calls your rich life. One of the aspects I really get from, from Ramit is that don't get rid of the latte, you know, the $5 vanilla latte or whatever that you get at Starbucks. Don't cut that out. 
that brings you pleasure. If something brings you pleasure and it's not hurting you, the saving of that expense isn't gonna get you anywhere financially. Focus on the big things. So I turn that around and I look at, okay, location, location, I want sunset, but I don't want the payment. So I'm gonna buy on Buena Vista, it's beautiful, they have nice trees, I have a larger yard, because I want a yard for the kids. I have the kitchen with the triangle, that the, the Wi-Fi, this is it. Uh, and I can still go to the river, I can go to the ball game, I can take the wife out on date night. But if I buy on Sunset, I can, I can write the check, but it's too, it's, it's stifling. And if you don't have extra money, just like on a VA loan, the residual income is more important than the DTI. If you don't have the residual income, the extra money to have life, then what's the house worth? I mean, really, is it worth that? So that's just something to keep in mind. That uh, Ramit, um, he, he covers that, that point very well, at least in my mind. All right, so what happens now? You're you understand the closing cost. We are qualified for X amount, but we're gonna buy at this comfortable level. We know we have the inspectors waiting in the wings. What are we doing? Well, now the process of really looking and buying a property. So once you look, and um, we have a great app that I'll introduce a little bit later that allows you to look through properties right there on your phone while you're sitting on the couch or at a stoplight. <laughs> and um, you find the property, you send it right over to your agent, to myself or whomever, and uh, we go back and forth. So then you decide that's the property I want. We, we've seen it, everything, we're putting in an offer. So once you put in an offer, the offer can either be accepted or countered. They have three days to do so. And if it goes past the three days, then um, it's uh, considered expired, but it could still be acted on. So for instance, if we put an offer in on a property you wanted to buy on a Wednesday, they really needed to answer by Saturday but they decided to wait through the weekend because they might get a better offer. So Monday, they counter back to you. you. You can ignore it because your obligation was for the three days, not for five. So, but let's just say uh, something is accepted, uh, the counter, the, the original offer, when we get in a contract, contract is executed, meaning everyone, all the parties sign, and then that contract opens escrow. Once escrow is open, it's your responsibility now through your agent to put your earnest money deposit, EMD. Your earnest money deposit is 1%, which is an average, 1% of the purchase price. So a $300,000 property is a $3,000 check that goes to the escrow department, escrow office. Once escrow is open, then your loan originator can submit the package that he has already gotten pre-approved with that specific lender. So it's already in the lender's pipeline, but they put the address in because initially it was a TBD or to be determined address. He puts, he or she puts the address in there and submits then the RPA, the residential purchase agreement, along with the escrow instructions and title instructions to come. That then, puts the loan into the pipeline of the underwriter to re-underwrite it. Now she's already underwritten your, your income and assets. She only has to underwrite the title escrow and the property. So fairly quick. Long story short, it's approved. You sign disclosures, an appraisal is ordered, maybe a couple other pieces of paperwork. Now we're at the signing table. Signing table, um, you know, most escrows are 30 to 45 days because of the bottleneck of so many people refinancing right now. Loans in a lot of cases are taking a good 45 days. So that's okay. The, per the point is that we're finally at the signing table. There's two types of fundings or loan docs. There's wet and dry. Now, interestingly enough, Southern California used to all be dry, a dry signing area, but Northern California was wet just as Southern California was an escrow state or area, Northern California was an attorney state. Um, different states, different areas have different requirements. So the differences between all of that is that wet signing is you're sitting across the table from the notary. You sign the documents, you push them over to the notary. The notary gives them to escrow. Escrow then gives them the title. Title then pushes the money over to the buyer. 
or rather the seller, and the seller then pushes the keys to you. It all happens the exact same day. You sign, you get you get the keys because this buyer, seller rather, gets the money. I may have confused that up pretty much, but the point is that a wet signing all happens on the same day, it's done. Dry is more like you sign on a Monday, docs are got, gotten back to the lender on Tuesday, the document, the uh, funding department checks those in and either funds if they have time, Tuesday or Wednesday, once it funds, then that information goes to title and they record perhaps Wednesday at the latest Thursday. Once it's recorded, bam, then you get keys. So it might sound a little complicated. Um, either way, it's usually uh, calendared so that they all close the same day anyway. Um, it just depends on when you're signing. You might sign and then get the keys two, three days later. You might sign and get the keys that afternoon. So, but that's just again giving you the whole picture so that when something is brought up you can have a little bit of knowledge to move forward with that so you have now finally geez dave took forever did it really you have finally gotten the largest investment hurdle done goal achieved you got it done now the you, you've handled it what's next now now you got to work. Now you got to move in. But hey, after you do all the work and you've gotten through all these hurdles and you're actually in the house, sitting down, you own a home. You got through it. You are a homeowner. Now, when you leave work and, hey, man, nope, I'm going home. Home. Always trying to get back there. 